Hey, it's Jeff today. Tell the kids all the time, I don't cook salt batch cookies. If you're a salt batch cookie, you gotta get away from around me. And they got a bakery for that. Guess what it's called? The transfer portal. Let's get it. And I don't think he's gonna throw the ball as much as he thinks he's gonna throw the ball now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is Ryan Day has made a change philosophically, but it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. Start, that means we got hey, it's Juck, and welcome in. What a day. So the day starts off with uh, I got uh, I got to talk to new safety commit to Sean Stewart. And we're talking about uh, our conversation that we're about to have, and that's going to go down at such and such a time. He texts me five minutes before, and he says, hey, is it okay if Dez comes on? Uh, Des Jones. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So I get on and I've got Deshaun Stewart and Des Jones. These are the two new commits from New Jersey. They play at DePaul Catholic together. Des is the wide receiver. Deshaun is the safety. And these two are, they're a package deal. I mean, them committing one day apart from each other. Um, they're, they're best friends. They're not like just teammates. They have known each other since they were five years old. And you can really see it when I'm talking to him. Uh, Deshaun says, I ask him about, you know, their NFL teams, some normal things. I have. I'm just trying to get out their personalities because I feel like once they get to Ohio State, for their freshman and sophomore year at least, they're on lockdown. They're not allowed to do any media. We never hear from them. Um, and then if when once they get a little older, you get to hear a little bit of their personality. They let them do some media. They'll let him talk after practice. Like today, we're going to talk about uh, what a couple of the guys had to say today um, in a select few after games, but we never really get to see their personality. So I think it's fun to kind of get to know him a little bit. So I said to uh, Deshaun, I was asking him about his NFL team. He said Baltimore. And Des says, and you haven't always been a Baltimore fan. I mean, these guys, they're just buddies. They're really tight. And I thought it was really cool. So it's a cool conversation. And I will, uh, I will uh, air that in a separate video. Um, but I also had a, I had a cool conversation with Max Torres. Max Torres is from Ducks Digest. I contacted him before this Carlos Lock, uh, Carlos Lachlan coach um, hire. And I wanted to talk to him about Oregon and Ohio State, Oregon coming into the Big Ten. Uh, what's the vibe out there about it? The attitude towards the Big Ten, how he feels the team is, et cetera. Well, it turns out that video of Carlos Lachlan, the soft batch cookie video that I just played, that everybody's talking about. And uh, man, what a dynamic guy this guy is, Carlos Lachlan. Every video I've seen so far has been like, yeah, that's the dude. Um, that is a massive addition to the coaching staff. I absolutely love it. And the more I see, the more I love. But the guy I got on from Oregon, Max Torres from Ducks Digest, is the guy he was talking to in that video that shot the soft batch cookie video. Carlos Lachlan, the Buckeyes hired him away from Oregon this week. Obviously, when you look at Carlos Lachlan's history, um, it certainly looks like Dan Lanning was the guy that you know really liked him and, and picked him up out of nowhere to kind of bring him into a major job. Uh, and... I'm sure I'm sure there was a lot of uh, a lot of heartfelt uh, goodbyes there between the two of them. It doesn't look like it was an easy move for Carlos Lachlan. What's the reaction amongst uh, amongst the fan base about that? Um, ah, man, it's I think it's weird to say, but I feel like a lot of people are are pretty upset about it. Um, it's not so much you know go go ahead and you know do your do your thing. I think a lot of people are obviously gravitating towards one of, one of my videos was kind of blowing up again after this move about the the quote with him saying the the soft batch cookies thing. Um, and, you know, basically kind of paraphrasing, but it's like, if you don't want to work for it, then you can hop in the portal. Like, I'm not going to give you anything. Um, so I've seen a lot of fans throwing that around and calling him that I completely disagree with that. Um, so, but you also have seen some fans that, you know, understand that this is just the way things go and they have their heads on straight as far as you got to trust what Dan can do. Because like I said earlier in the show, like he's made really, really good hires and every one of them has paid off. And 
I really liked how he acted in the press conference on Tuesday as spring practice resumed in Eugene kind of saying, you know, we want to, we want people that want to be here, but we also bring people in to try to develop them in, the, in their careers and get them to the job that uh, is best for them. So, um, you know, super respectful parting words from, from Lanning, but you just got to continue rolling with it. And um, another top point I think I've heard a lot and thought a lot about is that Ohio State is one of a handful of schools that you could maybe look at as an upgrade over Oregon. Obviously, they have a much, much richer history. Um, but in terms of, you know, the resources you have, the the caliber of football you play, the talent that you can recruit. I mean, I think those a lot of those things are are the same at Oregon, but it's certainly a big move for him to go to Ohio State. And man, the Buckeyes got a good one. So I did not know that that video was was yours. But yes, I've seen it recently. It's really circulating big amongst the Ohio State folks right now. Um, and it is a cool video and you get a little insight onto the, into this guy. Um, he's a tough dude. He's, he seems like a pretty cool dude though. You, you, so you've interacted with him quite a bit. Yeah, 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 I have. Um, and he, he's, he's awesome to talk to. Um, I think he's someone that, you know, can give you a lot of life perspective as well. Um, I'm sure if Buckeye fans have, you know, shot him a follow on social media, they see a lot of his ministry work, um, and kind of, you know, what he, uh, has to say about faith on on social media but he's a quote machine man i mean he's so so <laughs> fun to talk to he was always one of my favorite coaches to interview um when i was out there in eugene um because you you have to keep your camera rolling and your you know your tape recorder going with a guy like that because you never know what he's going to give you um and the one of the favorite things that he did when i got to kind of cover him was when he was talking about how he was chasing earl not earl campbell sorry but coach campbell the the running backs coach that served at Oregon um, for like almost three decades. And he was really, you know, passionate about leaning into the tradition that he created. And like, that's the standard that I'm trying to get things back to. And if you look at the play of the Oregon backs over the past couple of years, you know, hopefully Bucky Irving is going to get a nice little draft spot. And then Noah Whittington comes back from injury the the play of the Oregon backs have been nothing short of tremendous. But coach lock was in attendance for the first time today at practice. Now he didn't do much. Um, he got in a little late, but he got, you know, got the lay of the land, got to talk to his backs, talk to a couple of people. And we got to hear from quite a few people today. So a couple of his new players, Quinn Sean, who knows Coach Luck because he recruited him at Fl Florida State. Um, and they're from essentially the same town in Alabama. So that's some nice relatability there. Dallin Hayden knows Coach uh, Locke from Memphis, which is where he got his start coaching with the Memphis Tigers on Mike Norvell's staff and where Dan Landing met him. I'm sorry, he wasn't coaching on Mike Norvell's staff. He was an employee with the staff, but not coaching. Uh, Dan Landing was coaching. Um, Dan Landing then takes the major swing, hiring Lachlan out of Western Kentucky. Now, Landing brings him out to Oregon, makes him the running back coach. He stayed for two years. And there are a lot of people uh, at Oregon who are very upset that he left. Um, and they're trying to kind of compare him leaving Oregon to Ohio State with Tony Alford leaving Ohio State to Michigan. Um, they're saying he took a lateral, you know, it's a lateral move, et cetera. I mean, listen, I understand that Oregon is on the up and up, and they're a very good program. And they are, you know, when you look back at the history of college football in our lifetimes, Miami is a program that kind of rose up to become a power program there haven't been many uh in oregon i think is now having been to two national championships um you know they haven't won one yet but they've been to two after coming from you know they were just kind of an also ran in the pac-10 they made it to a couple rose bowls in their history but then under chip kelly you know they really got up to elite level and they've just kind of been bouncing back and forth in that almost elite range for a while now and I think with Dan Lanning, they are on their way to, you know, being a top five program consistently. I really believe that. Um, so despite that, it's not a lateral move. Uh, that's Oregon. And he went to Ohio State, which is, you know, consistently, it's the most consistent winning program in the history of college football. But obviously, there's eight blue bloods, um, and it is the bluest of the blue 
Alabama and Ohio State and Notre Dame, the three most consistent winning is biggest programs in the history of college football. And you could make the case that this moment in time, Ohio State is the most desirable place for a coach to be. Um, in fact, I don't think it's too, I don't think it's close really. Ohio State is. Ohio State is the most desirable job destination in the country right now. So definitely not a lateral move. And Coach Locke probably had a really tough time making the decision because he seems like a guy who who is very loyal. And uh, Landing obviously did an awesome thing bringing him out there, taking a chance on him. So it sucks. I don't like it. It's part of the reason I hated what Tony Alford did because I knew that it was going to force Ohio State to go do this to somebody else. So nothing I take any uh, – any happiness in the fact that he had to do that to Oregon. Um, and I don't fault their fans for being upset, but it adds a little extra juice to that game. It adds extra, extra juice to that game for sure, because they're fired up. And Max said that they are waiting for a piece of the Buckeyes and uh, careful what you wish for guys, because we got a machine rolling this year. Um, Ryan spoke on coach Ryan day spoke on coach lock on uh, 97.1, the fan. And he took a little swing at Jim Harbaugh. And it's getting mixed reviews. He said something to the effect of not all of us were born into football families when talking about Coach Locke. And that is being perceived as a reference towards Jim Harbaugh. Go ahead, Ryan. Talk it up, man. I wish you'd have done it sooner, but I'm happy to see he took a swipe at him. I don't really care. It's not very, It's not a great swipe. Let's be honest. That, that wasn't a great one. I don't think it was too incredibly clever. And uh, a lot of people are pointing out that that he didn't ever say anything when he was here and Harbaugh was talking all the smack about him. Not all the smack, but he made probably three or four comments over the years. Um, and Ryan Day didn't really stick up for himself then. So, you know, the why is he doing it now? I don't know. I'd prefer he'd have said something back then too. Now Harbaugh is gone. But I did hear that Harbaugh said something again about him recently, which I didn't. I hadn't heard. I just heard that today. So if that's true, go ahead, say whatever you want. Um, but as we talked about the other day, Jordan Davison, obviously the number one target on the board, and he has a relationship with Coach Locke. Coach Locke also in on Bo Jackson very hard, which I did not know, um, but he doesn't know Marquise Davis. He's going to reach out to him, and Marquise Davis said that he doesn't know him, but I mean, he's sure they're going to talk. Now all along, Marquise Davis, I've not been quiet about to me, He's the best running back in this cycle. He's the one I wanted most out of all these guys. But obviously, the Buckeyes have always been higher on Jordan Davison and Bo Jackson. Uh, well, Tony Alford wasn't higher on Bo Jackson, but Ryan Day has always been higher on Bo Jackson. So what direction that was going to go, I don't know. But at this point, I really think Coach Locke is going to be able to lock down Jordan Davison and Bo Jackson. I think he's going to get them both. But that leaves out my guy, my guy, Marquise Davis. So where does Marquise end up? Well, Tennessee's big in on him. He likes Tennessee a lot. Kentucky's up there too. But I think he is a Michigan lean at this point. And I think that Tony Alford is probably going to close the deal. And Tony Alford's coming with some heat, man. I mean, he is very invigorated now. He wants to prove a point. He's been trashed in the media. And he wants to make as big of an impact as he can. And what bigger way than to get Mr. Ohio football uh, coming up this season? I think Marquise Davis is going to be an animal uh, on the field his senior season. I think he's going to win Mr. Ohio football. And Tony Alford is going to get him up at Michigan. And uh, that's going to suck. It is going to suck because we're about to see another two straight Michigan Michigan recruits that are uh, Mr. reigning Mr. Ohio footballs. And that's... That's terrible. I hate it. I really hate it. Marquise seems a little different, though. He's a different cat. Um, Bo Jackson seems to be the one that, that has liked Ohio State more from the beginning. Uh, even though Marquise has visited a lot, I just don't feel like he's ever been, at least overtly, into Ohio State. Bo's kind of made it clear. Uh, and I just think that Marquise is going to end up at Michigan, and I just hate it. I really do. But we can't have them all. So what are you going to do? And as far as the talent of these running backs, when we talk about these three, in fact, the whole class, um, the whole top end of that class, there's maybe eight of them. I don't think there's much separation from one to eight. In a lot of classes, you get a guy like Trey, who is 
just, you know, he's got that little extra something that nobody else has. Travion Henderson, yeah, for sure. That That's a difference maker. When we talk about the guys at the top of this class, I think it's very little separation talent-wise between them all. And uh, I'll be very happy if we can land both Jordan Davison and Bo Jackson. But I would have been happier if it was both Ohio boys or even Jordan Davison and Marquise. Anyway, that's just me. doesn't matter. I think we're going to get both. I think it's going to be awesome. But it is of note that Marquise Davis is 10 pounds heavier and faster in his track time than he was last season. Uh, so it's pretty depressing. But anyway, James Laurinaitis spoke today. And James is so captivating to listen to these days when he's coaching the guys. Because as he's telling us how he's coaching them, he keeps bringing up stories from his playing days that are awesome to hear. Um, he told one story when he was talking about Sonny and Sonny going from safety to linebacker. Now that he has to tell him, now you got to slow down your feet because he's so used to crashing in from a safety position. And he says, Coach Fick always used to teach us, be slow until you have to be fast. So Sonny's now learning to, from the linebacker spot, not to move his feet so much until it's time and then hit it as hard as you can. And he called back another story about uh, he always teaches the guys to control the things that take no talent. You can't loaf. You can never loaf. If you're going to loaf, you're a traitor. You might as well go play for the other team and you can't make mistakes. And you would never catch him as a player loafing or not knowing where he was supposed to be. And I love hearing him talk like that. He talked about the rotation and he said that uh, he thinks he's got five. He thinks he's got five deep and he's hoping to play all five. And he thinks that the starter should be a week to week kind of deal. He said, I'm not going to reward somebody with a start just because they started last week. Um, they got, you know, if they have a bad week of practice and somebody else is on point, that's who should start. I absolutely love hearing that out of him because I think that he's going to make sure they're all ready to see that kind of playing time. Uh, they're in such good hands. He raved about Arvell Reese, his size, his combination of size and athleticism. He said it's some of the best on the team. And uh, we keep hearing more and more about Arvell Reese. So I'm really getting excited to see this dude. Um, he talked about CJ Hicks. We saw CJ have that fantastic scrimmage. Well, we didn't see a ton of it. We heard he had a fantastic scrimmage. We saw just a couple of little clips. And he does look great. Now, I was hoping when this... Uh, little media junket first started with James that we were going to hear some rave reviews about CJ. It wasn't that it was good, but a couple of the things he said made me feel like it's just not great yet. He said two things that weren't cause for concern, but mean he's just not there yet. He said, you got to keep on tapping on him to make sure you're getting everything he has to offer. And then he followed that up with, you have to follow a good day with another good day. So two little quotes there that just kind of make me feel like it's not as uh, glowing as of a review as I thought it was going to be. Uh, he didn't say that about Sonny. You know, what he said about Sonny was all positive, though he didn't talk as long about Sonny. But when you point out two things like, sounds like he's not getting consistent effort every day and you're still having a not so good day and then a really good day. So consistency still an issue with CJ, according to James. That's not great. I was hoping for better. And when we talk about the 4 3, I'll be excited to potentially see Cody Simon with Sonny and CJ on the field at the same time. We are going to see some of that. I think, like usual, when we hear things in spring, that we hear that kind of stuff and we think we're going to see a lot more of it than we ever end up seeing. And I think that's probably the case for this as well. But I'd really encourage anybody to watch James's session today because it was really cool. That story with Fickle was cool. Um, I love when he talks about his playing days. And then he went on to talk about recruiting. And he talked about how he thinks he has an advantage in recruiting, being a player, being a guy who loves where he's at, uh, having the benefit of knowing what works and what doesn't. And he is, guys. He's just going to kill it. He's just going to kill it. I mean, look, his number one prospect on the board TJ Alford, done, done data. And he's going to hold TJ Alford. I have no worries about that one at all. Eli Lee, a guy who honestly, who does he remind you of? He reminds me of James, man. 
the kid's a great athlete, not a special, special athlete like maybe TJ Alford or an Elijah Melendez, but he is an excellent athlete, crazy strong, crazy work ethic. Um, he reminds me so much of James. And when James gets a hold of him, you know, James picked him. And if James picked him, that's the guy I want. And uh, he got his top two guys. Those are the two guys he wanted. And I think we're going to continue to see him handpick his guys and be able to go pull them in just like we see Heartline do because he is so engaging. He's just he's just an impressive, impressive man. And the fact that Ryan Day waited so long before he announced that he was going to be the one to get that job, I don't know what he was doing. He was playing a game of some sorts because there's no way he ever doubted for a second what he was going to do with that position. You cannot be around James Laurinaitis and not know that. We can see it in little 15-minute clips. If you're around James Laurinaitis, yeah, man. Ryan knew all along he was hiring him. Caleb Downs. Listen, Caleb Downs is jacked. I, I didn't realize until last week uh, that scrimmage, the footage from that scrimmage. He is just massive. That is one big dude. But he feels at home, loves Columbus. Uh, Nathan Baird of the Cleveland Plain Dealer asked Caleb about the Twitter rumor that was started by a Michigan fan trolling Ohio State. Uh, talking about Caleb Downs was going to follow Caden Proctor and transfer back to Alabama. Um, then I watched Jeremy Birmingham <laughs> really be irritated that that line of questioning was used uh, because I think mostly because it was started by a Michigan troll account. Everybody knew that. Uh, and, you know, little reporter beefs I love. So that was pretty funny. But Caleb said, no, I don't feel the need to, uh, to, respond to that. I was still at practice. My actions were speaking for me. So that was pretty funny. He clearly really likes coach Matt G coach Matt Guerrero. And, uh, I think everybody's struggling to say that last name. Um, I heard Deshaun, uh, Stewart try to say it today, uh, when I talked to him, <laughs> that was pretty funny too. So we're just going to start calling him Matt G. And, uh, I really, the more I hear people talk about Matt G, the more I really enjoy this guy is, and the more I hear people talk about Matt Guerrero, the more I think that this guy is an excellent fit. I mean, it was pretty clear from the beginning when we first heard him talk and we heard uh, Jim Knowles talk about him. This guy really knows his stuff. He knows what Jim wants, um, but he's also really, really getting along good with the guys. Um, Deshaun Stewart said that Matt Guerrero was in contact with him more than any other coach. Now, if Matt Guerrero is recruiting that hard and that well that he's going to stay in contact with Deshaun Stewart and treat him like he's just as important as Trey McNutt and Fahim Delane. That speaks to me, man. I like that a lot. I really like that. And I'm really starting to like Matt Guerrero a lot. Bill Landis said to Bill Landis said to Caleb Downs, Matt Guerrero is so impressed by you, Caleb. He said that you prepare so much that you make him be a better coach. And Caleb said, uh, Matt's here all day. He's lying. But Caleb clearly likes him, and I like that a lot. And Caleb said he's very impressed by Emeka Abuka and Carnell. And he said that everybody has been very welcoming to him on campus. Quinchon Judkins talked. Uh, I didn't find anything of note on that one. But T.C. Caffey, walk-on running back. Uh, I really love T.C. Caffey. I think he is very talented. Not you know, He's not your typical walk-on. Um, and I love walk-ons at Blue Blood programs. I think it's the coolest thing ever. These are guys that can play at a lot of places. And instead, they choose to go pay their way at a place because they love the place. And T.C. Caffey loves Ohio State like we do. And uh, he's a guy that, that I really want to get behind this year. Because when I watched the running back drills, when they were first showing our new guys, right? So we got Quinshawn in there, and we're seeing how Quinshawn looks. Um, compared to everybody else. And then we got to see James Peoples. Um, none of those guys surprised me. I pretty much all had them pinned for what they were going to do. But when you saw T.C. Caffey, that surprised me. Because T.C. Caffey stacked up against those guys. You would never know that he was the one that wasn't on scholarship. You, know, you, know, you wouldn't. He looked, honestly, he looked more explosive than Sam Williams Dixon, who's on scholarship. Uh, and they're about the same size. Not only that, but Quinchon Judkins said in his little press junket that uh, T.C. Caffey is always taking notes in meetings. He always got his head down, working hard, super prepared guy. 
put all that together, and I'm a fan, big fan of TC Caffey. Hope he gets some more run this year because he's good and he loves the Buckeyes. I hope he earns a scholarship too. Left tackle Josh Simmons looks fantastic. He's dropped a ton of body fat. He's went from 28% body fat to 16%. And uh, this guy could be a true anchor left tackle this season if he continues to show this kind of dedication because he's always had the skill. We've known that uh, it was just a matter of, you know, the penalties, ton of penalties. And, you know, was he dedicated? Was he a go-getter guy or was he going to just, you know, be a guy who plays football because he's good at football and he's big, but it looks like he's dedicated now and that's dangerous. And that's great news for the offensive line. And we need that. Quinshawn was asked his opinion of the soft batch batch cookies comment, and he he did not have any idea what that was. I thought everybody would have got that. Um, that thing spread around social media really fast, and I was pretty sure that all the uh, running backs at least would have seen that before. So that wraps up the coverage of today's practice. Uh, the notes we got out. If I get some more, we will talk about some more tomorrow, and maybe we can get uh, Dylan Davis on to talk about practice on Friday which uh, there will be another practice Friday this week instead of Saturday. So maybe we'll get to that too. But um, all in all, sounds like a good day and everybody's progressing really well. Love what we're hearing. I love what we're hearing every day. Hey, it's Juck and my bookie has some free cash for the Juck on Bucks audience. Open up an account today at my bookie and we're going to get a 50% deposit bonus of up to a thousand bucks in free bets with the promo code Juck. If you're new to sports books, this is a good one to start at. And if you're an old vet, they got everything we want. It's very simple to use. You can pull out your winnings instantly, and they have an extensive selection of wagering options, including straight bets, parlay bets across sports, odds boosts, and even free plays pop up every now and again. If you like props, they got a whole slew of those, and these guys even got a casino over at my bookie. And to let us try that out, they got a $10 casino chip with our promo code JUCK. I like to bet some basketball during the tournament for a little bit of fun. I go a little heavier during football season, but no matter what your sport or your favorite wagering option is, you can find it at MyBookie. So open up your account today at MyBookie with the promo code JUCK because betting is fun, but betting with somebody else's money is even more fun. Check them out. A lot of people are floating the idea that the Buckeyes could enter the season with all five quarterbacks on the roster as they head into the season. Originally, I dismissed that. In the modern age of college football, I just can't see it happening. They can usually have a hard time keeping three scholarship quarterbacks, and that's been, you know, before the transfer portal was as prevalent as it is now. And they have to, you know, backfill with uh, a, a transfer, you know, like a T, like a Gebbia, Tristan Gebbia kind of guy. But to have these five quarterbacks go into the season, five quality quarterbacks would be pretty insane. And I'm not totally dismissing it anymore like I was once before. If Will Howard is named the starter, Devin Brown would have lost the job again for a second year in a row, but he would still have two more years of eligibility after Will was gone and two very serious competitions that he fell short in but gained a lot of experience. So from his viewpoint, it might make sense to stick around again. Julian saying, I'm sure he thinks he's going to win the job next year. So he's not going anywhere. He was never intending on starting. Aaron Noland, he was never intending on starting. So I, I can't see any reason other than looking at Julian saying, I think this guy's better than me and I can't beat him. So I think they're they're both staying, which would be Lincoln as the wild card. Now, Lincoln, I know a lot of people think that, you know, he was in this fight in the beginning or he was fighting for the role. He never was. This was his first spring, and even when you listen to him talk about himself, he knows he's not ready. So based on that, I don't think he would leave either. Now, there's always the possibility that somebody's going to come in and tamper with these guys and offer them you know, a big chunk of change, and that could change the equation. I think Devin would be pretty desirable for a lot of teams. But I do think there's now a chance that they could enter the season with all five of these guys. And before, I thought that was absolute craziness um but i think we are overplaying the amount of uh transfer worry at times and we saw it before will howard even came we heard it from a lot of people well if you bring in a transfer quarterback you're going to lose half the quarterback room nobody left and now here we are not learning anything and saying again 
you know, if you don't name a starting quarterback, you're going to lose a couple. Or if you enter the season, you can't enter the season with all five, you're going to lose a couple. Maybe these guys just like it there. Maybe they want to wait their turn. Maybe they want to keep fighting for it. We don't know. We're, we're very, uh, we're very quick to talk about transfer portal, but on this team, we've still yet to see any player of real consequence transfer. Chip Trainum would have been the most surprising, influential player that transferred. Julian Fleming, uh, I, I mean, obviously a great Buckeye, a guy I'm really rooting for at Penn State, but with the talent on this roster and what he brings to the table, I don't, uh, I don't know that that wasn't so much a conversation with Hartline about what this season was going to look like is the reason he transferred. He had his opportunity last year, uh, and he did fairly well for his role. But, you know, he, he's limited. We know he's limited. And uh, he's a great teammate. I, I don't, I'm not saying by any means that he was pushed out, but I would imagine that they had a conversation and Hartline was just real with him about what his prospects were for catching a lot of balls his last year in, in college. And they probably weren't very well at Ohio State. Much better at Penn State. So Chip and uh, and Julian were the biggest players of consequence. Now, if we compare that to other teams in Ohio State's ilk, um, their track record of losing players of consequence is much better than anybody else. It really is. So maybe things are just so good and they're recruiting such good character guys and finding a way to keep everybody happy this way or that way. There's a lot of different ways you can keep them happy. You know, CJ Hicks, a lot of people thought he was going to be out of here. Uh, he's not. He's sticking around and now it's it's paying off for him. I just think that we're maybe maybe becoming a little too quick to say, if this happens, then this guy's going to leave. Uh, we kind of toss it around a little too flippantly, I think, and I'm guilty of it too. But if they can, in fact, enter the season with five quarterbacks, all of which who are talented enough to start at a whole lot of colleges, that would be an unbelievable accomplishment. And I really hope that they can keep Devin and Will because I do think that you're going to need to at some point in the season. You're going to need that second guy. It's just, it's going to be very difficult to get through the season with just one quarterback the whole way. And I'm not going to say even because of the extra games. I think it's going to be because of the playing style. I think a whole lot, I think we're making more, uh, not when we talk about Ohio State, who is clearly going to be a playoff team and going to go deep in the playoffs. But when, when we talk about college football in totality, about the difference that these extra games are going to make, because there's only eight teams that are going to play an extra game and there's only four teams that are going to play two extra games everybody else is playing the same amount of games out of 134 we've got eight playing one extra game um and that's only if they played in the conference championship if they miss the conference championship that's not even an extra game to there so we're, we're blowing it out of proportion a little bit but for the buckeyes they're going to win well they're going to play in the conference championship so that and then round, uh, well, we're going to hope for a bye week. So then they're looking at 16 games to win the championship. So 16 games, Buckeyes championship season is in the normal playoff. They would play with the conference championship 15. So it's one extra game. It's one extra game if they get the bye than if they were to win the national championship in the old playoff format. One extra game. So I think we're just, we're talking about it in terms like, I mean, it was always going to be 15 games, even in last year's scenario. So now it'll be 16 games. No big deal on the extra games front. But the new style that Chip's going to bring, are we going to see some more quarterback run? Are we going to see some more physicality? That doesn't really suit Devin Brown's style. Um, Devin Brown is a, Devin Brown's a gunslinger. Devin Brown's a capable runner. Uh, but that's not his game. And I was listening to my buddy Dan last night on the Best Damn Podcast, which is a good one. You guys should check it out. Dan and Chad, good dudes, and and they really stay up on things. Well, well, Dan was discussing last night, and he's been following Devin Brown through a family connection since Devin Brown was in high school. And he's an expert on Devin Brown. He knows everything about him. Dev, that's never been his game. 
He's never been a runner at all. He's not a dual threat at all. That's not, you would never characterize this guy as a dual threat quarterback. He's a gunslinger. He's a Brett Favre. Um, he's capable of moving. He can get out of the pocket. He can get you two or three if you absolutely need it. But he's not going to be the guy you're going to put in and and do the same role that Will Howard was doing, which is, you know, a lot of runs. He, Will's going to run the ball, um, definitely with Chip. Anyway, um, I do think there's a chance now, and I think that's awesome. And uh, I still think that uh, that Julian Sand might at some point get some playing time this year. And I can't wait to see it because I think once they get a taste of Julian Sand, first I'll just say, I mean, like, you know the confidence I have in this guy. I think that he's going to pick up everything by the time the season starts and be at the same level as somebody who's been here a full year from now to fall. And I think that once they get him on the field and see what he's capable of in some live action, it's going to start planting some seeds. I just think it might happen. And uh, some people might say that's a bad thing, and it could be, but it's sure going to be exciting. And this is the most exciting season ever, as we know. We've talked about that before. We know that. So anyway, we're going to switch now to my interview with Max Torres of the Duck Digest. And we're going to talk a little Oregon, Ohio State football. Um, guy's got an interesting perspective. He's been covering Oregon since 2018. And uh, we talked about Dan Lanning. We talked about Coach Locke. We talked about the move to the Big Ten for Oregon. We talked about the Oregon-Washington rivalry. Uh, I wanted to know, you know, what's the feel from a person on the inside of that rivalry? Describe that to me. Is that is that like our rivalry? Uh, so we got into that, too. And it was a really enjoyable conversation. Thank you, Max, for coming on. So check that out. And later on, I will release my conversation with our two new recruits from DePaul Catholic, Des Jones and Deshaun Stewart, uh, at the same time, which was a really cool conversation too. So talk to you guys later. Thanks. All right, Max. So the Ducks joined the Big Ten this season. And it's happening at a time where from the outside looking in, it seems to me like support for the program uh, both financially and in the form of fan support has maybe never been higher. Um, does it seem that way to you? Is that accurate? I do think that's accurate. Granted, I only started covering Oregon in 2018. So I, I missed out on the Chip Kelly years when things were really at the all time high. And it felt like Oregon was ascending as a power in college football. But that is a really good way to put it uh, is that, the, the support is at an all-time high. I think that one of the biggest reasons for that is not only the product you see on the field, obviously, but Dan Lanning. And the, that sounds like an obvious answer, but I think you have to peel back the layers here a little bit and look at how Oregon fans have been through the ringer a little bit as far as getting a promising coach. And then what happens? They go to Florida State in the case of Willie Taggart, or they go to Mar uh, Miami with Mario Cristobal. So um, it feels like just when they're about to get it figured out, oh, this looks like our guy, he goes somewhere else and takes another job. But Dan Lanning has done nothing but reiterate, double down, triple down, whatever you want to say, his commitment to the Oregon program. And I think this coaching carousel we saw this past offseason was probably one of the most chaotic we've seen in recent years. And I think it only kind of got blown up even more when, when Saban retired. So um, we'll never really know if Lanny was concretely offered that job, but I think we can all safely assume that he was mentioned there. So the fact that Lanning is bought in for the long term and Oregon has some sense of stability here, uh, especially as they move to the Big Ten, I think that that has really positioned them for success. And then on top of all that, they're winning. So that that really yeah. helps. And then you're bringing in a lot of top recruits. Uh, the facilities are expanding. So it's, yeah, it's just all going right right now. They're pushing the right buttons in Eugene, it feels like. I couldn't agree more. I got to say, when that uh, A&M job came open and, you know, Lanning's name was being tossed about a lot and he kind of came out and made that definitive statement, um, I was like, yes, I love this guy. I love it. He's saying, I'm staking my flag right here. I can do everything right here. And I just, you know, as a fan of a program, I was like, man, they got to be feeling just on cloud nine after having so many of your promising coaches just say, nah, I'm going somewhere better to, to get this guy 
who to me is the most exciting coach you've ever had. Um, and then when the Alabama job came open, I think everybody was like, okay, now we'll see what he really meant. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I think most of us can assume that, yeah, he was definitely high on their list, but uh, it was really cool. But I look around just following college football over the years. And when you talk about major programs, it takes a certain type of guy who can run a major program. And he is kind of moving Oregon up into that major program echelon. And I think he's got the perfect disposition and personality to be someone who can successfully run a program like that or in Alabama or in Ohio state. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree that he seems like the guy that can kind of get Oregon over the hump. I mean, it seems like that's a little bit of what you're implying there with the question or just kind of how it feels uh, with where Oregon's at. And you look at his experience, obviously coming from Georgia, winning a national championship with the Bulldogs there, and then having the opportunity to coach with Nick Saban. It's it's so interesting how that has kind of automatically been, not automatically, what am I trying to say here? When people see the Saban tree, they just kind of automatically expect greatness. And anyone who doesn't achieve that, then you kind of fell short of the mark. But I think that he's shown time and time again that he knows what this blueprint is. Um, whether it's just what you see on the field or from his um, recruiting and personnel department, the way he constructs his coaching staffs. Uh, when he has a vacancy on his staff, he has moved very effectively and efficiently to to fill that void, to fill that those positions. And um, the other thing I was thinking about here um, was just how he's kind of different from some of the past coaches at Oregon. And this is in a little bit of a unique way. Um, when, when I was living in Eugene, Mario Cristobal was the only coach I really had a chance to cover there. And the access was relatively limited and you didn't see a lot in terms of just kind of behind the scenes type of deal. But with Dan Lanning, he's really flipped that on his head. He's with the whole ducks versus them cinematic recaps that we saw every week that show us some locker room conversations, some behind the scenes team meetings, you know, whatever it is, duck fans and I mean, Duck Media, they've never gotten that kind of access. So he's really peeling back the curtain to kind of show what's going into each week's win. And that was one of the questions I got to ask him when I was in Eugene for that USC game. So that, that might have been a little bit of a tangent, but that was just kind of one of the really interesting aspects, I think, where he's shown that he's different in how he's running things and handling things than his predecessors. Yeah. Uh, the video, the Colorado video, um, I, I had never, That's my all-time favorite. I, you, you never see that. You never see stuff like that. Um, and I absolutely loved it cause I can't stand the Colorado story, but I Me absolutely too. loved it. And I thought the way he put it was so spot on and perfect. And, uh, you know, I was a big fan of his ever since that right there. I was like, this is my guy. Um, and, and it sucks because the ducks come to the big 10 now and I can't enjoy him nearly as much because now he's obviously a big competitor. Um, Ohio State and Oregon are the top two picks to win the conference. What is the excitement like as the Ducks move into the Big Ten from the fan base and those around the program? I'd say it's generally one of great excitement, but you also find some fans that aren't super happy about it. And I think it's because they they grew up you know, in the Pac-12 era or like most of their life has been in the Pac-12 era. So they're going to miss the the tradition that comes with the Pac-12. Um, you know, I, I'm personally going to miss the Pac-12 after dark, um, just the chaotic element that Pac-12 football brought every week. And I'm sure that a lot of people in the Midwest or the East coast are saying, Oh man, football is over for the day. Like my team already played, but Hey, we, let's just throw this game on in the background while we're, you know, uh, knocking back a couple of beers or something. So I think that's something that I'm going to miss, but honestly, I think it's, it's a overall positive mood because the ducks are going to have a seat at the table with the big boys is kind of just how I've put it. Right. It's, we all know that it's going to be, we're already living in a world. Do you look at the playoff expansion conversation where it's the Big Ten and the SEC. They are, you know, the the it's the power two era. We can call it the power four if you want, but in real college fans know uh, it's the power two era. So the fact that Oregon isn't going to get left out, um, I think that that's very important. They're going to be playing against even better competition. Um, they're going to be playing um, on the biggest stage, get more exposure. 
I think that that's a big point that's been brought to the table in the conference expansion and realignment um, era is just what, what are the benefits that come with it? And I think just for me, um, I'm just going to be happy that it's going to be easier to watch the ducks because the Pac-12 network was an absolute uh, dumpster fire. I mean, yeah. I literally just couldn't even find, you couldn't always watch the ducks, but now That's with their, with you know them being with Fox and everything, it's going to be great. So overall, I think it's great. Um, the recruiting payoff has already been huge. Um, been a little slow lately, of course, but it's overall been pretty good, but you know, you can't have a move where everybody's going to be happy. Um, so Oregon has always, not always, but for the last 10 years has recruited very well. Uh, nothing like under landing though. It, it feels like he kind of came in and said, we don't have to settle right here. We can go after the number one, number two guys in every position group. And everywhere I look, Oregon is in on the top guys. Ohio state is in on. And they're not just in on like they offer. They're in on these guys are talking highly about Oregon. And and uh, it, it's it's a different feel to me when it comes to recruiting from Oregon. Uh, have you noticed the same thing? Yes and no. Um, I think that Mario Cristobal really kind of laid the blueprint for this. And you could also even talk about Willie Taggart before him because Oregon at one point, I can't remember what site it was on. It might have been Rivals. They had the number one class in the country. Uh, under Willie Taggart, but who did Taggart bring in? Mario Cristobal. So when he took over, he brought that Bama pedigree and what he learned under Taggart and took it to the next level. So then Landing comes in, following in Cristobal's footsteps, and he just flips that thing into high gear. Uh, and the Ducks signed their best class in program history in the 2024 cycle. And I, I think that Landing has really just leaned into what Oregon is and everything that it can be. Um, I think one of the the one of the sayings that kind of comes to mind is the rooted in substance, which was one of the things that he said that we got to see in the um, the cinematic recap videos. And I think that's awesome and really crucial for Oregon's identity because so many people, especially people who don't live in Eugene or fans of Oregon, um, what they talk about is the flash and the uniforms and all that, and then the zero championships. So I think he's just really asserting himself with within this program and then brought more broadly to the country to show that he thinks Oregon can be something incredibly special, but to, to show that they can play some great defense and, and be good at almost everything. Cause that's what you want to do. Um, so um, I think that the recruiting future for Dan Lanning and the ducks is, I think the top 10 in the country is going to be kind of the new floor. And if they can stick around in that top five more regularly, um, I think some people would think that's an aggressive take, but I truly think that with where Oregon's at, if they keep delivering on the field and, and pushing all those right buttons, Marshall Malko is a huge part of that. The chief of staff that Lanning worked with um, at Georgia uh, and at Texas A&M, I believe. I mean, he's just been a huge, huge asset for the Ducks on the recruiting trail. So the arrow just keeps pointing up. But on my end, I'm getting a little bored. I'm ready for some commits to talk about. <laughs> I'm with you. We just had a we just had a big a uh, big weekend, oh, but we got it. we got four like that. Bang, 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 bang. But yeah, I I don't. I mean, you say top five is is aggressive, and it is. But I, I really think that that is uh, that's doable, and I think that he wants it. I mean, he's in here in Ohio, uh, heavy after two of our very best players, um, right here in Ohio, and uh, kind of made me think that maybe Ryan Day was. Uh, was had a little extra juice to get uh, Carlos Lachlan uh, as maybe a little bit of a, a shot across the bow there. I don't know, but it's pretty interesting to follow. Um, what has the attitude been against? So Washington, obviously, as someone from Ohio, we have a massive rival uh, and Oregon and Washington are rivals. Washington goes to the national championship game last year, beats Oregon twice on their way to get there. What is that? Tell me a little bit about that rivalry. Oh man, it's uh, it's it's uh, intense. It's incredibly petty. Um, you know, the, the fan bases really hate each other. I, I went to one uh, Oregon Washington right. game, the only the only game I've been to in Seattle. Um, I know a lot of my my followers may not like to hear this, but I mean the Washington Stadium Husky Stadium, like that oh. setting. They call it the greatest setting in college football. I don't know if I'm ready to say that, but it is freaking beautiful. Um, and while I was there, um, there were, I was hanging with some buddies and they were throwing, uh, pieces of bread 
Washington fans are throwing pieces of bread at Oregon fans, not like aggressively or anything, but just like because you oh, know, like duck. when you go to a when you go to a lake, yeah, ducks like yeah, eat, you know, okay. like pieces of bread or whatever. <laughs> they um they put rubber duckies in the urinals in the men's room. Um, I don't know if that's too graphic. Hopefully that wasn't too aggressive, but like that's those great. are kind of just some of the aspects to to let you know kind of where where these fan bases are coming from. Um, and then it's Husky Hate Week in Eugene. Um, I, I think one of the things that's so funny, if you're looking at it from an Oregon perspective, I mean, you could not be at a higher point um, as a program than Washington, and then just all of it crumbles down so aggressively, so quickly. You go to the national championship game, get the brakes beaten off of you by uh, Michigan, then your head coach leaves to take the Alabama job. All your best players leave, uh, either via the, the draft, obviously, or now the the transfer portal, and and then now you bring in a, a head coach and Jed Fish that I think is a very good coach, but has shown that he doesn't stick around too long. So while Washington was on cloud nine, Oregon was obviously pretty upset, but then you know things kind of balanced out a little bit, and and Washington had a, a very tumultuous <laughs> off season. But I mean, all that said, Washington has always been very very well coached, certainly since the Chris Peterson days, which is a majority of my lifetime. So. I think that they're still going to be a, a pretty solid team, but it's it feels from an Oregon perspective like they can definitely beat them this time around. But until they do, all it is is talk. So you got to show up and you got to play the game. Yeah, I, I appreciate the little bit of insight into that rivalry. Uh, I mean, it sounds pretty similar to what I'm used to, to be honest. Though last year it kind of took a turn for a little bit nastier than usual uh, with the whole scandal and everything. But you sounded like you had a lot of joy talking about Washington's off season. Um, I also had some joy watching the, our friends up North uh, have a, have a pretty tumultuous off season as well. Uh, but when we talk about those guys, so I noticed something weird on social media and I've talked about it on my show a couple of times and I, I'm getting a lot of feedback that other people are noticing this too. I kind of live on Twitter throughout the day. How can and you not? The Oregon fan base and the Ohio state fan base have kind of clicked up. And the USC fan base and the Michigan fan base have kind of clicked up. And if you were just to kind of look at these, this is the thing I love most about college football is every fan base kind of has a personality. And I would have always assumed that Michigan and USC would have gotten along real well. Um, and I've always kind of liked the Oregon fan base. They've never really been a problem for me. And, and I just, I, I don't know. Did you, have you noticed this at all? Um. Maybe a little bit more so on the Ohio State and Oregon side of things, um, j just because of obviously the Lachlan move, and then they have a little bit of a history together after the national championship game. Um, and then with Oregon getting that win in Columbus in 2021, just I was at that game, Justin, and it was just phenomenal. Like I was geeked out just being in the shoe. Uh, all the history was amazing. Um, and that was the coolest moment in my time as a as a journalist like walking on the field after that game was was insane um but so yeah I, I really haven't seen too much of a connection aside from the more so the Oregon Ohio State um side of things because it feels like those are two programs that are definitely going to have that uh that game I think it's October 12th in Eugene uh yeah Oregon just Oregon just announced that it's going to be uh a, a, they released the color schedule for the fans it's going to be a black game so maybe we have some blackout uniforms for the Ducks when the Buckeyes come to town. Um, and don't forget that I think maybe Oregon fans have a little bit of a, I don't know if I'd say animosity, but um, they, they, they're they ready for Ohio State. They want to face Ohio State because um, they were, I think they were supposed to come out in 2020 uh, to play the Ducks because uh, they had that home and home um, yeah. scheduled. But I don't think it would have even happened anyway, not just because of COVID, but the wildfires that summer were unbelievable. So like, it, it probably wouldn't have like physically been able to take place. So Oregon fans are ready to face Ohio state. They're, they're juiced up. That's, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would be too, if I was them. Um, but I mean, I got to tell you, the bucks are looking really good, man. It's, it's going to be a heck of a game because uh, those two programs really got it going on. Um, you guys have been dealing with USC for a good while now. Um what is uh what is your take on what uh what Lincoln's got going on? It's he, he's kind of trying to put a, a new big newfound effort into actually getting a competent defense. The staff that he's brought in uh on the defense is looking really good and uh he's really focused on recruiting on the defense and they're getting some some great 
defensive players, guys I haven't seen sign with them in quite a while, out of the South too, which was really interesting to me to see that. They had a heck of a week or two weeks ago. And uh, I think that now when you guys, the new, the four new teams coming in, Oregon to me stood, you know, heads and heads and shoulders above the rest as we move into the next three, four years. But I'm starting to kind of think that I might want to need to re reevaluate where USC is kind of going to be in the next couple of years. Yeah, USC has been, um, been an interesting program to follow for the past couple of years, especially from, from my perspective, because I live in Long Beach, California. So that's kind of the, the hometown school, right? I guess you could say UCLA too, but they've been such a dumpster fire. Um, hopefully they can turn it around a little bit, but, but USC, I think in the early years with Lincoln Riley coming over from Oklahoma, I think that he, it was interesting because he showed just how much you can accomplish from one year to the next by leaning into the transfer portal. But then he also showed from in the following year, how an over-reliance on the transfer portal can hurt you. And also how you need to maybe, I don't know, maybe he was too loyal to Alex Grinch and should have, you know, canned him way earlier than he did. Um, so I think it's, it's been really interesting to kind of watch where USC is at. Obviously you have Caleb Williams come through and Heisman trophy winner, you know, phenomenal quarterback and, um, probably going to be the top pick in the draft, but he showed us that a quarterback can only do so much. Like he was the definition of actually, maybe he wasn't the definition of th this team will go as far as this quarterback can take us. Cause if they had a somewhat competent defense, like you said, they would have had so many more wins because he was getting you, you know, 35, 40 points a game, uh, guaranteed almost. So I think it's been really fun to see what they do this off season with the personnel moves that they made, obviously, um, shaking up that defensive staff, uh, getting, getting rid of Alex Grinch, I think was a move that needed to happen. Um, there, I feel like they're making all the right moves, bringing in, um, uh, coach Henderson, I think is his name from, from the Rams to coach the defensive line. Um, and they're already yeah. seeing some payoff there with some of those guys coming in like justice Terry, the five-star Dean lineman out of Georgia, um, you know, long way to go. So you got to see if you can actually hang on to these guys, especially the ones in Georgia. I don't think that Kirby wants to let those guys get out of the state. Um, but, uh, it's great momentum right now. I think they're, they're doing all the right things, but, um, it's going to be fun to see how much growth they've actually made once the real opponents start lining up, um, because they were just getting dominated at the line of scrimmage, especially in the Oregon game last year. That was one of the games I was in Eugene for, and, and you could just tell they were not where they needed to be along the lines of scrimmage. And I don't think Oregon was really that worried about USC. Um, but they got to keep an eye on them moving forward for sure. Now it seemed to me like Oregon kind of had their pick in the transfer portal and getting Gabriel and Dante Moore was pretty impressive. But as we look at the roster, who are some of the most impressive new additions outside of those two? Outside of those two, there's two guys that have really been the talk of the conversation um, this off season. Like I said, the Ducks just resumed spring practice yesterday and they'll have practice going for a majority of the month until their spring game on April 27th. But Jabbar Muhammad and Evan Stewart arrived from the transfer portal uh, to join the Ducks. Jabbar Muhammad, of course, being the Washington corner and Evan Stewart, the Texas A&M transfer. Um, it was crazy to me because I feel like more so the Jabbar Muhammad edition, it just felt like a luxury um, because the Ducks have some good corners coming back. Jaleel Florence um Dante Manning and then some really young some young guys coming up Dalen Austin but they also did really well recruiting they got two All-Americans um in the 2024 class and then they also got the number two Juco player in the country he's like a 6'4 190 pound corner so they have all these guys they also got Cam Alexander from UTSA and then you go in and you get the best corner that you faced all of last year uh from a rival um I don't think you can draw it up much better than that and then you lose Troy Franklin who's by all accounts, the best wide receiver that Oregon's ever seen. And then you quote unquote, replace him or reload the room um, with Evan Stewart, who was a former five-star decent production at, at Texas A&M, but like crazy twitchy, like freak athlete, kind of yeah. a billing. And you flip Jeremiah McClellan from Ohio state along the way. Like it just feels like those are two perfect examples in my mind of like additions that you don't need. If Oregon didn't get either of those guys, I think they would still be okay but it's like from their, from their point of view, it's like, oh, we're Oregon, so we can get these guys. Why would we not go get them? Yeah. And when you look at the team, what are your biggest areas of concern? 
Biggest areas of concern, um, I think you have to look at the interior D-line in terms of just it being a question mark because they lost so many guys. Popo Amavai, Brandon Dorless, Casey Rogers, Taki Taimani. Those were all veteran guys that played some really good football for them. Specifically, Dorless and Rogers. I think those are going to be the two uh, biggest losses from that D-line. And then you also have to look at the cornerback room, I think. I, I don't know if I would say it's a concern necessarily. I think when you when you say that at this point in the calendar year, it can kind of get blown out of proportion. I think it's more of a question mark. If we get to fall camp and they're still talking about that and they still don't know kind of where things are at with guys, I think that's a little bit more appropriate. So I'd probably deem them a little bit more of a question mark right now. Um, safety is one that feels pretty good. So if I'm just kind of looking at that secondary, I have to look at the pecking order in that cornerback room because there are so many guys in that cornerback room. And you brought in two guys from the portal that uh, probably didn't come over to, to sit on the bench. Um, yeah. So I'm just from a roster standpoint, I'm just ex I'm interested to see how they're going to manage the shuffling there. Maybe we'll see some corners move to safety. I think that's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, but aside from Kobe Savage and Tysheem Johnson, um, one transfer from Kansas State and the other one a returner from last year, I'm just kind of curious how that depth chart is going to shake out specifically at safety because it's a little bit of a question mark after those two guys. How, what what is your feeling on? So I think that Oregon is now pretty much a almost I don't know perennial playoff team. Is that the feeling that everybody around the program has? I think so. It's especially you look at how close they got, which you know it doesn't doesn't matter how close you get. You have to get there, but we have to look at where things are at now. You have an expanded playoff, and I feel like you feel really comfortable with what Oregon's expected to do this year is going to be able to get them to that playoff again for the first time since the inaugural playoff, um, yeah. the debut playoff in 2014. So I think playoff certainly the standard, um, but I think Oregon can really put themselves in a good spot. If, if they were to win the big 10 in their first year there, that would be, you couldn't ask for a better start. I guess you could ask for them to win the national championship, but just given the caliber of opponents they're going to face, in the Big Ten, with like you know Ohio State being one of their main competitors, um, I think that that definitely is the expectation for Oregon moving forward is to to be a playoff team every year with this expanded field. It seemed to me like in the transfer portal, Dan Lanning kind of had his pick of whoever he wanted, and there's a whole lot of uh, talk about Oregon money and Nike money and and all that. Um, is there is there a misconception about that, or is it accurate that there's just Oregon could do whatever they want with as much money as they need, and they'll, and they'll get it done? I, I think there is a little bit of a misconception about it, um, only so far as um, like it's it's kind of a win lose scenario, right? If, if something happens that's good for Oregon, uh, a lot of people on the outside will be like, "Oh, of course they're doing that. Of course they got this recruit or whatever because they have Phil Knight and all the Nike money." But then. If something doesn't happen, um, like you know, like like a coach leaves or you miss out on a recruit, they'll you'll have fans saying, "What Uncle Phil couldn't throw the bag out for this or that." So, <laughs> I do feel like it's very real as far as his ties to the university, and obviously, there's no one that supported the program more, I think, from a financial standpoint than him, and and I feel like um, that's going to continue to be the case, but. I also don't think that Oregon necessarily has the same type of money as some of these old programs with more history and more tradition that have been at the top of the sport for as long as they have. I don't think they have like the Texas oil money or um, old money like in the South, like something like that, um, because they are a newer power in the sport. So I think it can be a little bit of a misconception in terms of how much they necessarily have at their disposal. Clearly, it's enough to be very competitive, but I'm not actually sure how it matches up with some mm -hmm. of these other programs that have five, 10 Phil Knight type of figures. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's any other Phil Knights, but, but yeah. or just yeah, people with crazy yeah. deep pockets. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it, it's a pretty interesting situation when you, when you talk about the relationship with Nike and Oregon, that's something very unique to the, to the sport. And, and uh, I've always found it pretty interesting, I guess, T Boone Pickens, T Boone Pickens at Oklahoma State when he was really back in Oklahoma State. It's it's kind of the last guy I can remember that like you had like one single guy that was really just kind of the engine of the program financially. Um, that was always pretty interesting to me. But I'm wondering, you know, how much is it Phil Knight specifically, or, but isn't Nike like now 
like more of the whole board is kind of like somehow tied into Oregon or is that, a, is that a misnomer? Um, I've heard, could... here's what I'm saying. I've heard people say when Phil Knight passes away, that's all over. And I don't think that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so as far as the board being tied in, I mean, that, that could be the reality, but I personally don't know enough about that to confirm that or deny it. Um, but I don't think that the, the Nike relationship with Oregon is going to change much of at all. Um, after he passes, just because I, I'm sure that that would be something that he would want taken care of um, in writing, you know, moving forward. Um, but I think it, it sure is a little bit extra fuel of the fire for um, for Oregon to get that first natty. Um, and, and just like on this topic real quick, I know we were talking about Washington, if you don't mind. Like, yeah. can you imagine what Washington could do if they got Bezos and Bill Gates to buy in like the same, like Amazon and Microsoft to the same level that Phil Knight has bought into Oregon. Like you have some, and then you also have Boeing out there as well. Like there are so many opportunities to just get ridiculous money fun, funneled into that program. So I think that's going to be interesting to watch from, from afar. I've never even, I've never even thought about it, but you're right. <laughs> they absolutely have a, uh, have some, some big money there uh, tied to that program too. And what you said about the stadium, absolutely right. It's on my bucket list. So is Otson, and I'll be there soon. I'll be there next year. But nice. uh, but Washington, wow, man, it is gorgeous. And, and I've heard it's so loud, too. The stadium shakes. Um, and there's some connection with my hometown. Don James is from is from my hometown, and he was obviously an awesome coach out at Washington. So there we have it. That's our guy. Max Torres, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate you, buddy. And I hope you guys enjoyed. I will see you tomorrow. Chuck on Bucks out.